It's been a long time coming, but we finally arrived at the last well-known floor guardian within Nazarick. The ruler of the Frozen Glacier and guardian of the fifth floor, Kokaitis. Well, Kokaitis if you watch the dub, and Kokutis if you watch the sub. Regardless, we're here to learn about Nazarick's second best bug and highly capable master of weapons. So let's take a look at everything from his lore and creation to all the external elements that influence his character and hopefully we'll answer the video's title question of who is Kokaitis. Just like we did with all the other Floor Guardians, we can learn a lot about Kokaitis by first looking into the one that created him. In this case, it was the Ainz Ul Gon guild member, Warrior Takemakazuchi. So we'll start with him and gain a bit of insight into what he might have been thinking when he was creating the tomb's fifth Floor Guardian. Warrior Takemakazuchi, or technically Bujin Takemakazuchi, with Bujin meaning warrior, was one of the founding members of the guild. He played as a Nephilim samurai with a glass cannon build that had relatively low defense but extremely high offense. And he really was a warrior at heart. He loved to test his skills in a challenging fight against a difficult boss. Things like jumping into dungeons, fighting headfirst with no preparation, or facing down impossible odds really got him going. And he would either overcome them with sheer skill or end up going out in a blaze of glory. So basically, he seemed like the type of guy who'd enjoy playing Dark Souls. But aside from engaging in earnest combat, one of his biggest passions in Yggdrasil was collecting and crafting different weapons. Of course, this also doubled as a way to improve his build since he was always min-maxing it as best he could in order to one day defeat his rival Touch Me in a 1v1. Speaking of which, from head to toe and beginning to end, his build was completely themed around a samurai. For instance, his name is a reference to a Shinto god of thunder and swords, one that's most well known for leading a military campaign against the terrestrial deities who inhabited Earth. And this was all at the orders of one of the chief deities of heaven, Amaterasu. Even his equipment was Japanese themed as well. I mean, his main weapon was a katana, and the armor he wore was a heavily stylized fantasy version of the typical Japanese samurai armor. As for his combat build, it was designed to strike his opponents with incredibly powerful blows. To put into perspective just how powerful this man was, it was said that among all the melee combat specialists of Nazarick, only Nishiki on Rai's sneak attack focused build could deal more damage in a single hit. This might have been his attempt to imitate the famous Japanese sword fighting style called Iaido, which emphasized killing one's opponent in a single strike with a single motion. This also included drawing and sheathing the sword at lightning speeds, which is something that you've probably seen numerous times before in various anime. But what you see there is typically a more stylized version of what you can expect from real life. The real Iaido is more like an art, emphasizing grace, penitence, and smooth technique. Anyway, aside from his high damage strikes, he also had multiple skills that summoned spiritual warriors modeled after the Buddhist deities known as the Five Wisdom Kings. Since Buddhism plays a prominent role alongside Shintoism in the world of Japanese spiritualism, this further built on Takemikazuchi's overarching Japanese theme. He pretty much tried his best to grab everything that was Japanese in the game and put it onto or into his character. Though probably the most important thing to know about him was that he was the kind of guy to name his sword Takemikazuchi Mark I, then name the upgraded version the Mark II, and so on and so forth, all the way up to the current Mark VIII. Put simply, I don't think he was a particularly creative person. Sure, he was obsessed with collecting and creating weapons, but if you can't really muster up enough creativity to find a cool name for your own personal passion projects, then you're likely not very creative in general. So if we use that as a groundwork for a lot of his decisions regarding Kokaitis' creation, then Kokaitis' design starts to make a lot of sense. And what I mean by that is that I don't think he put a whole lot of thought into Kokaitis' lore or backstory. In many ways, Kokaitis is kind of a clone of Takemikazuchi's character. High attack power, mediocre defense, high damage attack skills, and so on. Similarly, rather than go for something wildly different or unorthodox for his personality, he went with something very familiar. Much like his contemporary and rival Touch Me who created Sebastien, his creation doesn't have a particularly complex or creative personality. Still, like most of the guild members, he based it on a trope that he found enjoyable, but that's pretty much as deep as he went with it. After that, he didn't really flesh him out much further. So, just like how it was with Sebas and his combat butler trope, since Takemikazuchi romanticized the samurai so much, he decided to design Kokaitis around that theme. Ultimately though, what makes Kokaitis interesting as a character is very similar to that of what makes Sebas an interesting character. 
in the sense that it's not necessarily his design, which isn't particularly complex or nuanced, but rather how his character develops in subtle ways over the course of the narrative. You see, in response to the events that occur throughout the anime or the light novel, we see Kokaitis slowly develop into much more than what Takemikazuchi ever intended for him. But before we get into that, we'll first break down everything there is to know about Kokaitis' character, starting of course with his name. Kokaitis is a reference to one of the layers of hell in Dante Alighieri's epic poem called The Divine Comedy, the first part of which is named Inferno, resulting in the poem being often colloquially referred to as Dante's Inferno. In the poem, hell is divided up into layers of concentric circles, with each successive layer growing smaller and deeper, and each being home to those guilty of different sins. Just before the very bottom, the center of hell, we have the ninth layer, the frozen lake known as Kokaitis. The lake itself is said to be frozen solid, with traitors, oathbreakers, or any person who has betrayed someone that they had close ties with being entombed in this ice. For as Dante writes, the treacheries of these souls were denials of love and of all human warmth. Only the remorseless dead center of the ice will serve to express their natures. Incidentally, because of its connection with extreme cold, the word Kokaitis is occasionally used in Japanese video games for powerful ice magic, and given that Kokaitis' floor is known for its cold environment, it's a pretty notable connection. Honestly, the name he gave to Kokaitis is actually quite fitting, making you wonder if he really did come up with it himself. Especially considering that he seems like the type of guy to name his creation something like NPC number one. Now, you might think of it as an interesting bit of irony to name Kokaitis after a place where traitors are punished, but once you know more about his personality, it does make a good amount of sense. So let's explain. Kokaitis' specific personality is probably a reference to one of the samurai tropes common in Japanese fiction, which we'll dive into in just a second. The samurai, originally meaning roughly the same as knight, but later taking on the meaning of soldier, are often said to have followed a code called Bushido, translating literally to Way of the Warrior. And most samurai character tropes tend to portray characters who embody different interpretations of the code. In a sense, you could loosely compare it to Western knights and their code of chivalry, though there are some major differences. First of all, the code is unwritten and unspoken. It isn't explained, so you just have to learn to understand it intuitively by studying and copying other samurai. It was largely influenced by Buddhist and Shinto religions, the code, generally speaking, emphasizes absolute loyalty to one's lord, a frugal life, and mastery of the martial arts. For those of you who know anything about Eastern spiritualism, you'll recognize a lot of dualism in Bushido. Dualism is, to put simply, the notion that everything can be divided into two opposing sides, and the ideal way to live is typically to remain in balance with both sides. This is the idea behind yin and yang. In Bushido specifically, the point was for the samurai to balance out their capacity for great violence and aggression with an equal capacity for peace, contemplation, serenity, and wisdom. The most popular formulization of Bushido came from a book titled Bushido, The Soul of Japan. Written in 1900, the author Nitobe Inazo specified that Bushido could be summarized by eight major virtues. Righteousness, courage, compassion, respect, honesty, honor, loyalty, and self-control. True warriors live life to its fullest and possess a courage that is confident, intelligent, and strong. True warriors don't need to prove their strength and have no need to be cruel. True warriors don't have to promise anything. When they say they will do something, it will be done. Essentially, warriors train to become strong, and then they use that strength to help others. That's what this code is, and you can tell throughout the anime that Kokaitis attempts to embody many of these virtues. As a quick aside, one interesting facet of Bushido was that this code was actually developed in the Edo period in Japanese history, and it's believed by some historians to be the means to restore the lost honor of samurai following the fierce and brutal Sengoku period. In case you're not familiar, the Sengoku period was most notable for its near-continuous civil war between various military generals. Each was attempting to seize power from the other and control the rest of Japan, and it became this age of warring states that lasted for nearly 150 years. Lots of historical anime is set either during this era or immediately following it, and although we see depictions of the honorable samurai clashing with the lawless thugs and bandits, the line between the two was often blurred. For instance, there was a practice known as sujigiri, where a samurai would test the effectiveness of a new weapon on some random helpless passerby or peasant. 
It wasn't widespread by any means, but it did happen. And due to the constant military conflict, starvation was rampant among the civilian populace, and new samurai were often pressed into service through violence, intimidation, or bribery with food by the local armies. Now, in contrast, the Edo period was one of relative peace and prosperity. The new shogunate had consolidated power, outlawed various activities, and reunited Japan. It was here that Bushido was developed, assumed to bring back those samurai ideals that once existed even before the Sengoku period. Though little evidence exists to suggest that some form of Bushido actually existed back then. So perhaps Bushido was a simplification and unification of a diverse variety of widespread beliefs and ideals. In any case, despite Bushido being invented after the Sengoku period, Japanese fiction often tends to portray it as having existed during the Age of Warring States. This ultimately led to the formation of various tropes and character archetypes in fictional dramas set in the Sengoku period. Now, I'm not saying that there are a bunch of rigid, clearly defined tropes that everyone uses, but those of you who have watched or read any anime or manga that's set in the Sengoku period will probably understand what I'm trying to get at here. But if you are confused as to why I'm telling you all this, well, naturally, someone like warrior Takemakazuchi would have adopted one of these samurai tropes for the NPC that he created. Whether it be the silent ronin anti-hero who wanders the land and protects the innocent, or even the hot-headed kid who's always looking to prove himself in battle. There must have been a stereotypical samurai theme that Takemikazuchi wanted for Kokaitis. So, although it wasn't specifically identified as such, we like to use the nickname Uncle Samurai to refer to the character trope that Kokaitis was given. The Uncle Samurai is usually a close friend and fiercely loyal retainer of the Lord or General type character. It's often found that in these kinds of stories, the lord or general due to any number of reasons has or will die early on in the plot, and it's their son that typically ends up being the protagonist. The Uncle Samurai, despite being unrelated by blood to the lord character, has formed such a strong bond with the lord that he is trusted to help watch over and raise the son. Usually, the Uncle Samurai would teach the kid how to fight, and even raise the child as if it was his own. Now, this may not seem very fitting to Kokaitis' character, but in Season 1, Episode 2, there is a conversation between Demiurge and Kokaitis where Kokaitis fantasizes about being this very type of uncle to Ainz's kin. So, this trope does relate, and it's in these types of stories that the Uncle Samurai would have a contrasting personality to the brash and aggressive son, usually embodying the proper Bushido code, with his great loyalty to his former lord often being demonstrated when they help protect the son from various incidents that the son will inevitably find himself in. Even so, given all of that, the Uncle Samurai isn't perfect. They usually aren't any kind of tactical or strategic genius. As a matter of fact, they are usually both less intelligent and less skilled at fighting than the lord that they serve. Still, they were trusted by their lord to be a lieutenant and lead a detachment of troops into battle, not for their leadership or tactics, but rather because they had the loyalty of their men, which in turn brings respect and loyalty to the lord, much of which is born out of respect for that superior wisdom and skill that their lord possesses. So, at this point, you've probably been able to pinpoint many parallels of the Uncle Samurai character trope with Kokaitis, especially when you look at some of his more notable scenes from the anime, most of which are exemplified by the personality that he was given, rather than the backstory he should have. Speaking of which, we don't know much of Kokaitis' backstory, and knowing Takemikazuchi, he might not have really wrote much of it at all. However, we do know that much like his creator, Kokaitis loves collecting weapons, whether this was Takemikazuchi just lacking creativity and mimicking himself in Kokaitis, or whether this is another example of NPCs inheriting personality quirks from their creator, it's difficult to know. Ultimately though, a lot of the traits of the Uncle Samurai character, as well as Bushido in general, do describe Kokaitis pretty well. The most obvious example being his fierce loyalty to Ainz. Then, he is also not very tactical or strategic, seems to only battle for the sake of battling, as well as is generally fairly serene when in battle, but also friendly outside of it. More specifically, there are many scenes where we can see this honorable Uncle Samurai personality in action. Like when other NPCs are arguing, he often chastises them for behaving shamefully in front of eyes. He is also very honest and friendly to all NPCs, summons, mercenary vassals, and so on, and even attempts to build a friendly camaraderie with all the other warriors in Nazareth. Conversely, he finds deceit, underhandedness, and guile distasteful. We see this often in the comedic side stories released as bonus material for those who purchase the Blu-rays in Japan. 
For example, there's one scene where Eines asks the Guardians to try putting on the famous Shakespearean play Romeo and Juliet. And of course, Albedo and Shaltir naturally pressure him into playing the role of Romeo, so that the two of them can play Juliet. Shaltir attempts to get Kokaitis to vote for her to be Juliet by telling him that she'd get him the role of Tybalt so that he could spar with Eines. But despite being such an extremely tempting offer, he ultimately resisted the bribe and remained neutral. And it really was an extremely tempting offer. Sparring with Eines is actually one of Kokaitis' primary interests. I mean, in one of the other side stories, Eines was trying to come up with the rewards that he can give to the Guardians for all of their hard work. When he asked Kokaitis what he wanted, naturally, one of the rewards he requested was an opportunity to spar with Eines. Incidentally, he also asked Eines to make an heir. But unfortunately for us, Eines rejected both requests. Then, just like how the Lord trusts the Uncle Samurai to lead troops into battle, the whole Lizardman arc pretty much embodied that aspect of the trope. Kokaitis was entrusted by Eines to annihilate the Lizardmen with the undead army that he was given. Unfortunately, the Lizardmen withstood the attack, leaving Kokaitis ashamed for bringing defeat to Nazarick's name. But he didn't despise them for it. Instead, he was impressed by the Lizardmen's ability to win even when faced with overwhelming odds. So when he went back to Nazarick, he asked Eines if he could subjugate them instead of wipe them out. Eines agreed. But to redeem himself of this failure and remove this stain from Nazarick itself, Kokaitis had to achieve victory over the Lizardmen by himself, a task very fitting for a samurai that was looking for redemption. Of course, just like we saw, the Lizardmen stood no chance, but lucky for them, they had already proved themselves in Kokaitis' eyes, which resulted in their later resurrection after being defeated. Now, that was the short version of that story. There's actually a whole lot more elements to that arc that I want to talk about. But for now, this is the basis of Kokaitis as a character. Everything that could or did go into his creation, we thoroughly analyzed. So let's take a look at that little subplot now. Kokaitis is one of the few NPC characters in Overlord that have their own subplot. There's subtle elements that were placed throughout the Lizardmen arc of Season 2 that allowed him to develop into something beyond Takuma Kazuchi or Ainz's expectations. So let's see how exactly this happened as we take a look at everything else that went into making Kokutis who he is. You may recall that Kokutis' name refers to the ninth layer of hell, the frozen lake known as Kokaitis, with the lake itself frozen solid, entombing any and all traitors and oathbreakers within its icy grasp. Which is rather strange, considering that loyalty and honor are fairly central to Kokutis' character, especially the part about being loyal to his lord. So, I think the aspect that his name draws from is more in the sense that Kokutis would be very keen to punish traitors. But then again, most of the Guardians would be. After all, they all share that same undying loyalty to the Supreme Ones. And it's not like warrior Takemakazuchi could have known that when making Kokutis. So it remains a bit of a mystery as to where the NPC's loyalty comes from exactly, even to Ainz. Personally, our theory is that it's largely a function of the fact that as former NPCs, they were flagged as allied characters not only for the purposes of friendly fire, but also so that they would obey any command given to them by the guild members. So when they were turned into these living creatures and gained their sentience, they also carried this aspect forward as this absolute unquestioning loyalty. However, if you look carefully, you can still see the difference between characters like Kakitis, Sebas, and Albedo, who were specifically written by their creators to embody a strong degree of loyalty and duty, in comparison to characters like Aura, Mare, Pandora's actor, or Lupus Regina, who are quite a bit more free-spirited in their interpretation of Ainz's orders or their behavior around him. Out of all of them, Kakitis could very well be described as one of the most loyal NPCs, insofar as he simply tries to do exactly as he's told with no real interpretation. But as we'll see in just a minute, this is the very opposite of what Ainz actually wants. First, let's talk about Kakitis's morality. His karma rating is in the neutral range, but leaning slightly more towards the good side at plus 50. Above 100 or below negative 100 seems to be the point at which a character begins to significantly demonstrate evil or good tendencies, with truly vile personalities like Albedo and Demiurge capping at negative 500. With neutrality, it's a bit of a catch-all for pragmatists who look out for themselves and the people that they care about, encompassing those who are ideologically committed to being impartial or neutral as well as people with interests or priorities that don't neatly fall into a traditional good or evil dichotomy. Kakutis is an example of the latter. As we know, he is first and foremost a warrior, and as such, respects others with martial prowess and skill. 
especially since the Bushido code that he seems to embody so closely emphasizes a certain degree of compassion and kindness, making Kakitis lean a bit more towards that good alignment. Unlike Sebas, he probably won't twist or defy orders to help out the innocent, or even hunt down evil people with a furious vengeance, but he will be as nice, honest, and reasonable as his orders allow him to be. Which leads us to his character arc. Much like some of the other NPCs like Shaltir, Sebas, and even arguably Albedo, Kakutis experiences a subtle conflict between how he was originally created and his loyalty to the Supreme Ones. These character arcs can be quite difficult to pick up on in the anime, mostly due to the light novel's general lack of focus on them in comparison to more traditional dramas. So these arcs tend to get lost in the details when the anime adaptation comes around. What they're meant to be are interesting little subplots that the anime really doesn't have time to delve into, if at all. I mean, they only have 4 or so episodes for like 300 pages of each volume of the light novel. On top of that, the NPCs are often designed to have quirky personalities to suit Overlord's brand of dark humor. They don't necessarily need actual character arcs if they're instead just used as comedic devices. On the other hand, NPCs like Sebas and Kakutis, who aren't very comedic at all, are often more in need of these character arcs to keep them interesting. And in the case of Kakutis, everything from his sense of morality and samurai trope personality to even the details of his creator play into it. The defining moment for Kakutis came in Volume 4, the Lizardmen Heroes arc. He had been told by Ainz to lead an army against the Lizardmen, but to not take the field himself. And like a dutiful samurai, he obeyed his lord, even if he wasn't very good at following through with the orders he was given. And as a result, the Lizardmen rallied and were able to come up with a hard-fought victory. It wasn't pretty though. Former enemies banded together under one loose banner, employing desperate gambits and sacrificing many lives as they all fought to the death. But in the end, they did defeat Kakutis' army, leaving him no choice but to return to Ainz ashamed. Part of the reason for his loss was because of the usual NPC hubris. Kakutis simply presumed that whatever forces Ainz gave him would be sufficient to annihilate the Lizardmen, believing that because it was the Supreme One who'd ordered it, the plan was infallible, as well as assuming that the NPCs and forces of Nazrek were inherently superior to the inferior lifeforms of the New World. It was also in part to Kakutis just not being very bright. Demiurge had concluded that this was a test of Kakutis' competence, coming to the conclusion that Ainz had deliberately assigned him forces that were incapable of simply steamrolling all over the Lizardmen. But Kakutis wasn't as bright as Demiurge, and he couldn't conceive the possibility that Ainz may have just given him this task as a test. Now, losing on purpose isn't exactly something an honorable samurai would try and do. I mean, even after Demiurge pointed out that Ainz may have intended for him to lose the battle, Kakutis still felt a strong sense of shame and regret for his failure. Fortunately for both Kakutis and Ainz, the army was mainly comprised of weak skeletons called Pop Monsters, which regularly respond to Nazrik on a daily basis. And so, despite losing the entire army, the cost of the operation was effectively nil, not accounting for the Elder Lich Igaba that Ainz had created as an experiment. This person was heavily implied to be one of the captured Sunlight Scripture soldiers from Season 1. In any case, whether all of them died or none of them did, the effect on Ainz or Nazrik would be inconsequential. So Ainz didn't care too much whether Kakutis won or lost. He knew Kakutis wasn't a military expert. In fact, his motivation with the entire campaign was basically just to see if NPCs could learn. See, back in Yggdrasil, Improvements in skill, ability, and knowledge was largely tracked with what you'd expect, experience points. You gained power through acquiring XP to increase your level and improve specific classes. By contrast, the new world was a bit of a mystery. Experience points were largely an abstraction and simplification from reality. So Ainz wondered how these rules differed in the new world. How were they the same? It would seem ridiculous that a wizard who spent all their life studying magic would still be level 1 since they've never killed any monsters. More importantly, Ainz wondered whether he, or any of the other level 100 NPCs for that matter, could even increase their level beyond the level 100 cap that was placed in Yggdrasil. And if he couldn't gain experience, did that mean he wouldn't be able to learn or get better at anything? His adventuring as Momon was part of an experiment to find that out himself. But he also wanted to see if the rules were any different for the NPCs. And so Ainz did what any MMO gamer would do, go find some monsters to kill. That was how it normally worked in Yggdrasil. Fight monsters, gain XP, acquire some loot, have some fun. Though he didn't expect to actually get any XP or useful loot from the Lizardmen. 
he merely viewed them as what were effectively toys for his amusement. Not only because his undead race prevents him from having any kind of empathy, but monsters and MMOs are just a means to an end. And naturally, Eins brought that attitude into the New World. In this case, he saw them as an opportunity to learn about the New World's mechanics, nothing more. But as we saw, things are never so simple. The Lizardmen are neither mindless monsters, nor are they evil creatures who exist to be farmed for loot or rewards. They are each their own individual, coming together to form a civilization, a culture. And with that comes their own hopes, dreams, conflicts, and so on. They share far more in common with humans than even Eins does. The title of the volume of their arc, The Lizardmen Heroes, alludes to the fundamental nature of it. They are the protagonists of their own heroic struggle against a terrifying overlord. Ask yourself, if the Lizardmen were a far more humanoid looking race, and we were following things from their perspective, would we not have a radically different outlook on the events? The differing audience reactions to the Tomb Invasion arc versus the Lizardmen arc are certainly interesting in that respect. Many more of you started to realize that Heinz might just be the bad guy when he slaughtered all the adventurers. But it should have become apparent that this was the case when he attempted to genocide an entire species for an experiment. Now, though many in the audience did not sympathize very heavily with the Lizardmen, Cocytus certainly did. And so, in defiance of Eins's direct orders, and despite the fact that he had just shamed himself, Cocytus requested that the Lizardmen be spared. To request something from one of the Supreme Ones is practically already a grave insult. After all, as far as the NPCs are concerned, they exist only to serve the Supreme Ones' will. And yet, Cocutus was willing to defy it, even after failing to accomplish Ainz's orders. Perhaps it was in part because the Lizardmen were so sympathetic. Part of Bushido emphasizes having a righteous and benevolent character. Though unlike the more traditional Western superhero morality that touched me instilled into Sebas's character, this doesn't necessarily mean standing up against villains or ignoring orders to protect the innocent. Even if a samurai was loyal to an imperialist, warmongering lord, they would still have to follow their orders. The only caveat is that the warrior ought to behave respectfully and gracefully while doing so, trying the best they can to avoid the unnecessary bloodshed of innocence, as well as assist those victimized by the war, such as orphans. But this wasn't the only reason he didn't want them to die. The primary reason why Cocutus was so invested in the Lizardmen's fate was that he respected them. Remember, Bushido was about the balance between martial prowess and wisdom. Being able to master your skills at fighting is just as important as being honorable and wise. And so, when the Lizardmen rallied to come back against all possible odds, Cocytus, as a fellow warrior, was greatly impressed by their tenacity, spirit, and skill. And perhaps he inherited the part of his creator, Takamikazuchi, that romanticized facing down impossible odds and either overcoming them with skill and luck, or going out in a blaze of glory. I mean, there's no doubt that Takamikazuchi would have loved to see the Lizardmen's battle against Nazarick. Hell, he would have been the first to be rooting for their victory. So this is likely another example of a mechanic that an NPC inadvertently inherited from their creator's personality traits. Of course, just because Kakutis had asked him, that doesn't mean that Eins would agree. You might be forgiven for thinking that conquering and ruling the Lizardmen was all part of Eins's master plan. After all, even Demiurge seemed convinced that everything had taken place as Eins had foreseen. But Overlord's signature humor typically entails Eins and his NPCs misinterpreting each other. And so, in reality, Eins couldn't have cared less about what happened to them. Like I said before, he saw them as monsters who existed only for his personal enjoyment. And so, when Cocytus made the request to save them, he was thoroughly shocked, surprised even, and a little concerned that Cocytus seemed to be empathizing with the Lizardmen but ultimately very excited. Remember, Eins's primary motivation was to see the NPCs learn and improve, but the first step towards that would require them to have to think for themselves. Normally, their reaction was simply to obey whatever commands or plans Eins came up with, and rarely did they interject with better ideas. This was concerning to Eins, since his mind was still that of a human and was not really capable of living up to the lofty expectations they set for him. Cocytus in particular was notorious for this, often telling others and even Eins that he viewed himself as little more than a sword, that his job was not to think, but to cut down whatever he swung his sword at. However, Eins had repeatedly told the Guardians to disregard this way of thinking, and try to become more than that. He wanted them to be more independent, become able to think for themselves. So when Cocytus made his request, Eins was more than eager to hear his reasoning. What was the basis behind it? What benefit could it bring to Nazarick? 
perhaps Cocutus saw something more than just beings to act as an experience farm. Of course, Cocutus's motivation was not based on how they could be useful to Nazrik. He felt embarrassed and ashamed to admit that it was simply to honor them as warriors. Try as he might, he couldn't come up with a useful purpose for them. With regards to their militaristic capabilities, they would provide effectively no value. I mean, the bulk of Nazarek's armies were comprised of considerably stronger undead troops. So Eins then suggested massacring them and using their corpses for necromancy experiments, to which Cocutus couldn't justifiably claim that they'd be more useful alive than as undead slaves. Especially since the warriors Eins could use their bodies to create were individually much more powerful than any lizard man. If not for the intervention of Demiurge who could articulate a better case, the Lizardmen might not have made it past mid-second season. Of course, it's not as if Demiurge did so out of the kindness of his heart. He seemed to think that this was some kind of test from Ainz that the NPCs had to overcome, and so he racked his brain trying to come up with potential uses for them, ultimately settling on the idea of using the Lizardmen as a test case for ruling other species. After all, it would be good practice for Ainz's impending world of domination. Well, that's what Demiurge thought anyway. And so, rather than be tasked with exterminating them, Cocutus was ultimately put in command of them, told to rule them without the use of terror tactics. Eins would go on to resurrect a small handful of those who died in the battle, including several of the chieftains, using the promise of resurrection and future support as a carrot to dangle in front of them. It was through this that Cocutus was basically appointed governor and administrator of Eins's new Lizardmen province, and he would go on to be a fairly good administrator of the tribe. Most of his time was spent leading them on subjugation missions against other demi-human tribes in the area, such as the Toadmen. While Nazarek's undead armies could no doubt conquer them in mere days, perhaps Cocutus enjoyed the challenge of leading the relatively weak Lizardmen against other demi-human tribes who matched their strength. Maybe Eins had told him to use this opportunity to continue to practice leading troops in battle. Or perhaps he was searching for a way for the Lizardmen to make useful contributions in the army and soon-to-be nation of Nazarek. Though, it was probably a combination of all of these factors. Now, although he was their new leader, Cocutus's policy was to interact with the Lizardmen in a friendly, respectful manner, presumably in order to avoid fostering resentment. Fortunately, the Lizardmen race had a culture of tribal conflict, wherein tribes would conquer and be conquered by other tribes on a regular basis, mostly as a result of resource or territorial battles. So, the Lizardmen were able to adapt fairly quickly to this new arrangement, and Cocutus effectively assumed the role of tribal chieftain. Of course, treating a conquered civilian populace with respect and dignity is also something that you'd expect from a samurai practicing Bushido. So, you might say it was simply in Cocutus's nature to maintain such a camaraderie with his subordinates. Aside from leading them into war, Cocutus was also in charge of the day-to-day -day operations and decisions. The first major order of business was to relocate the various tribes into one large village. As a new colony of Nazarek, the Lizardmen were provided with appropriate support, including golems to help build infrastructure like walls and watchtowers, a small detachment of elite Nazarek old guarders and Nazarek skeleton troops to defend their settlement, as well as temporary food support. If you'll recall, the dwindling fish population was a minor plot point early on during the Lizardmen arc and Ainz freezing the entire lake solid probably didn't help much in that regard. Fortunately, the guild owned a minor magical artifact called Dogda's Cauldron, which could produce any kind of food one requested in exchange for a small amount of Yggdrasil gold. So this is what was used to help provide for them in the short term. As for the end goal, the Lizardmen were supposed to become self-sufficient, and with Dogda's Cauldron, they were able to quickly begin construction of various fish farms under Cocutis's direction. This support wasn't just a benevolent charity, though. The Lizardmen were expected to worship Ainz as their new god, and a life-sized statue of him was placed at the center of the village, to be administered and tended to by their highest-ranking druids. Offerings such as fish and flowers were placed at the foot of the statue, worthless to both Ainz and Nazarek, of course, but the size and rarity of the offerings were a symbol of the Lizardmen's commitment and dedication. Each of the Lizardmen wore necklaces with an emblem depicting the insignia of Ainz Ul Gon. This effectively marked them as property of Nazarek, as well as was a promise of protection. Any minion of Nazarek would know that those wearing it were under its dominion and should not be harmed. Furthermore, others who damaged Nazarek's property would be committing an offense of the highest order against the Supreme Ones. As such, they would be met with the appropriate retribution. Ultimately, the message was clear. Oppose Nazarek and be destroyed by its overwhelming power. Worship and love Ainz and be the beneficiary of his mercy and kindness. And it was Cocutus who was by and large the one to come up with and implement the majority of these ideas. 
to one who's only concerned before now was how best to be the ideal sword for Ainz, having to effectively become a governor of a province was a big change for him. Many of the common tropes Cocytus was based off of ended up being subverted. Like, rather than join under an opponent after his loss, it was Cocytus who took the Lizardmen under his wing as subordinates. Rather than simply being a loyal underling whose only thought was how best to follow orders and cut down his foes, he had to become a great leader, learn skills of the diplomat and solve domestic problems. Overall, perhaps he finds his new job far more enjoyable than simply killing what he was told to. But yeah, that's how Cocytus became this independent subject of Vines whose work is now central to Nazrak's operations in the surrounding area. As I mentioned in the beginning, he's one of the few NPCs that gets a noticeable subplot resulting in a more well-developed character. But that's only who he is. Let's now proceed to the next part and take a look at how strong he is. Cocytus is well known for having the best defensive capabilities, given his almost maxed out physical attacks and numerous powerful skills, weapons, and abilities. But as we already know, that doesn't necessarily translate to being the strongest out of the Floor Guardians. There are many methods that each of them can use to gain the upper edge if they were to ever fight him. Even so, the fact that Cocytus was once able to deal damage to Albedo in the past is certainly something worth looking into. So let's take a closer look at everything from his race and job classes to the skills and abilities that come with it. And hopefully by the end, we'll have an answer to the video's title question of how strong is Cocytus? Let's start with his race. Cocytus is a member of an unknown insectoid race that blends features from multiple different types of insects together. This includes multiple arms, large mandibles, a scorpion-like tail, and a tough exoskeleton. 30 of his levels are distributed into his racial classes, split between a total of three different types. Meaning, an insectoid in Yggdrasil is classified as a heteromorph, one of the three main race types that a player can choose upon character creation. In case you don't remember, as a heteromorph, Cocytus has access to a robust racial class tree in addition to his normal job class tree, and this would allow him to literally morph into a new creature as he takes levels in more advanced racial classes, kind of like how a Pokemon evolves into a stronger form. As a result, heteromorphs can have multiple racial levels in multiple different classes, which is opposed to demi-humans who can only have one or two classes, or humanoids who cannot have levels and races at all. As for Cocytus' specific build, the level distribution includes 10 in Insect Fighter, 10 in Vermin Lord, and a further 10 unknown, bringing us to the aforementioned total of 30 racial class levels. Now, if I had to guess, the 10 that are unknown are likely put into his primary race, while Insect Fighter and Vermin Lord are the evolutionary forms of it, especially since they don't seem to refer to any specific type of insect. They're rather just broad descriptors of insectoid elements. In fact, it's possible that all playable insect characters in Yggdrasil were derived from the same base insect race, perhaps called something like insect. For instance, the Pleiades and Toma, one of the other insect creatures, has only 12 racial class levels, two of which are unknown and 10 of which are simply arachnoid. So this could infer that first you would have to select the base insect class, then the class after would be the type of insect you want. This isn't something that's just isolated with Entoma or Cocytus either though. Similarly, one of the five worst Kyohuko also has two unknown insect levels then more levels in a class called Insect Druid, which sounds remarkably similar to Cocytus's Insect Fighter. It's almost like both of them started with the same base insect race, and then for their next racial class they had a choice between things like Insect Fighter, Insect Druid, Insect Ranger, and so on. Then, depending on which form they picked and how far up they progressed, they would end up with radically different appearances and capabilities. So personally, we believe this type of character progression is the most likely since honestly, it's really difficult to pick out what kind of insect race Cocytus is just from looking at him. I mean, first we see he has beetle-like features, similar to that of the Japanese rhinoceros beetle, which really fits his character motif since its name in Japanese is the Kabuto beetle, a reference to a particular kind of Japanese helmet possessed by samurai something the samurai-obsessed Takamikazuchi would definitely go for when creating an NPC. The thing about the Kabuto beetle though is that they're named after their particularly notable head, a feature that Kakutis clearly doesn't resemble. Not to mention that there's all the other features too, like his scorpion-like tail, his bipedal mantis-like movements, and the ant-like mandibles. So like I said, maybe all insects are part of one big happy insect race, then you can mix and match whatever crazy appearance you want after. However, it is still possible that there are many base insect races, each with their own unique sets of abilities. 
With this format, these races would then follow the more standard RPG format, and they would share a lot of derivative races like Insect Fighter or Insect Druid, which any insect-type race could ultimately freely pick. Kind of like how both a human and an elf can become wizards. In fact, there appear to be quite a few racial classes which are mirrors of job classes. Though, this is generally more common for the demi-human races rather than the heteromorphs. For example, goblins can get racial classes in Goblin Cleric or Goblin Mage, but they can also get formal training and level up the job classes of Wizard and Cleric. Thematically speaking, these racial classes tend to be more primitive in nature and relate more to the innate inborn talent of the race in question, whereas job classes require something akin to formal education and training in a civilized society. This is yet another mechanic that was borrowed from Dungeons & Dragons. In the case of an insect fighter like Cocutus, that means it would share some basic similarities with the normal fighter class that humanoid races had access to, but with large portions of it adapted towards insect life, culture, and morphology. Speaking of Cocutus' insect fighter, the fighter name is actually a direct reference to one of the core classes in Dungeons & Dragons, the fighter. As a core class, a fighter was meant to be extremely flexible, allowing the player to build it into almost any kind of combat specialist they could think of. Pretty much all of the classes, features, and abilities were user-selected, in the sense that they could specialize in pretty much anything. Dual wielding, archery, mounted combat, disarming, multi-hit attacks, shield-based offense and defense, whatever, you name it. If it involves combat, then you could probably specialize in it. Now, while most classes could access most of these features to one extent or another, the fighter was special in the sense that it could choose more of them than any of the other classes. More importantly, the fighter was also often a weapons expert. They could choose a single kind of weapon, like a longsword or a heavy mace, and they would gain buffs to accuracy, damage, or other stats while using it. This latter part is probably the most iconic aspect of fighters in Dungeons & Dragons, primarily because it was one of their only exclusive features, and thus it is the class feature most likely to have been borrowed by Mariyama for fighters in Overlord. However, that's not our focus. We're trying to figure out the insect fighter race class, not a generic fighter job class. Yes, fighters in general are weapons specialists, but there's something unique about insects and other heteromorphs that you wouldn't see from a regular fighter. It's what's known as natural gear, their natural weapons and armor. Natural gear is a mechanic that basically entails any kind of weapon or armor that is innate to the creature, like a powerful exoskeleton or some sharp claws. It has several major advantages over regular gear. For one, it doesn't drop upon the user's death, so you won't have to worry about replacing it if you, say, accidentally died while raiding an enemy guild. For another, improving them was considerably cheaper than manufactured equipment of equivalent power. Like all weapons, they had a data crystal capacity that determined the number of special abilities that could be added to them. But by being a part of the user's body, natural equipment would grow more powerful as one leveled up. It was much easier than having to find the certain requisite item drops needed to upgrade regular equipment. Finally, they didn't need to be repaired, since healing spells would restore any damage they accrued. This meant that opponents who specialized in Sunder abilities designed to target and destroy the opponent's equipment would be ineffective, as a simple healing spell could fix the problem. This also meant that they could be worn indefinitely, unlike regular equipment which suffered degradation over time and in battle. It even eliminates the time the user would normally have to spend either repairing their armor or swapping it out for a new set of equipment. In exchange for these advantages though, natural gear came with four important disadvantages. First, in order to be acquired, they required dedicated racial levels. Most humanoid and even demi-human races couldn't acquire them, meaning they were restricted to specific classes and races. On top of this, you had to sacrifice levels in other potentially useful classes in order to further acquire, specialize, and improve them. This is related to the second drawback of natural equipment. They were generally worse than top-of-the-line manufactured gear. It was almost impossible for natural gear to be the equivalent of custom-made divine quality gear. Doing even that much would undoubtedly require a very specialized build. In general, most natural gear peaked at around legendary quality, which meant that if one's opponent had farmed up a set of divine gear, then they'd have a noticeable advantage in stats. The third restriction was that one could not stack both natural gear and manufactured gear, meaning you couldn't wear armor over top your exoskeleton, and you couldn't use your claws while holding a sword. You could still wear accessories like rings, cloaks, and necklaces though. Now, finally, and arguably the most important limitation was that natural equipment could not be swapped around easily like regular equipment. You see, 
Most players only pulled out their most expensive and valuable equipment when they were sure that they wouldn't lose it on death. So, general adventuring was typically performed with equipment that was one or two steps down in quality from your go-to and most valuable set of gear. And it was highly customary to swap between different sets of lower tier items, especially since it was much easier to obtain several sets of lower tier equipment for the same cost as a single set of higher tier equipment. As a result, players built custom sets designed for specific situations, like how the cloak Ainz wore into battle against Shaltir in Season 1 was built to maximize his holy damage resistance at the expense of his fire damage resistance. Now, all of these limitations together meant that you would only see investments in natural equipment on very specific builds, and committing to such was a very major decision. Let's use Shaltir as an example. Her fingernails are a natural weapon possessed by a vampire. In her case, these natural weapons were relatively inconsequential as she possessed the divine quality weapon, the Spewit Lance, though her fingernails were still durable enough to parry Brain Unglouse's attacks. Even so, it's unlikely Pararanchino invested heavily into using her claws as an actual weapon in battle. It's more likely the claws were acquired incidentally from taking levels in vampire-related classes. In Kakutis's case, his natural equipment comes in the form of his thick, armor-like exoskeleton that's covered in icy spikes. Given that this is Kakutis's fully leveled form, it's clear warrior Takuma Kazuchi had made the decision to invest very heavily into it, especially since it has to act as Kakutis's primary source of protection, replacing any armor that he could have otherwise worn. As such, it's likely around as top as a set of legendary class armor, but still not quite that divine level. We do know for sure that it is at least comparable with the rest of the melee combat guardians, Sebas and Albedo. Even if he does have the lowest defenses among the three, melee fighters must have much more survivability than any other kind of build, since they do have to close in on an enemy and engage them at a close range, thus increasing the amount of attacks that will be directed towards them. That said, we don't know much about its defensive capabilities. What we do know is that not only is Kakutis immune to cold damage, he is also outright immune to damage from lower tier weapons and magic of low tier spells an ability very similar to the dragons that we saw Nabe fight against in Season 1. It's entirely possible that some or even all of these features were provided by his exoskeleton, though he could have acquired this immunity from other accessories or from specific class features. I mean, immunity to such spells was seemingly quite common amongst both players and the NPCs that they created, likely to protect against foes who relied on summoning large quantities of weak monsters to overwhelm their opponent. Even Ainz possesses the ability to outright ignore all damage from any foe below level 60. However, this is due to one of his undead racial class features, and not attributed to his gear. In any case, we theorize that acquiring and improving natural weapons and armor required one to take associated race class levels in things like Insect Fighter or advanced racial insectoid ones that specialized in improving melee combat. Insects devoted to spellcasting like Kyohuko would naturally have a less durable exoskeleton since they weren't expected to be on the front lines, and as such, avoided classes like Insect Fighter. But Takemakazuchi would definitely want and need to select classes like that for Kakutis' melee-oriented build. We also suspect his tail counts as a natural weapon too, as he does use it in battle against the Lizardmen, though it isn't specifically confirmed in the light novel that it actually had counted as one in the game. Regardless, he does have multiple arms for equipping multiple weapons, so even if his tail is a natural weapon, it's likely that warrior Takamakazuchi didn't bother to invest or improve it very much. Alternatively, his use of the tail as a weapon could have been something that developed during the transition from Yggdrasil to the New World. After all, many things have changed, from mechanics like friendly fire to the fact that NPCs are now thinking, sometimes breathing, living beings, instead of mindless script-based NPCs. The fact that Kakutis can use his tail as a weapon could be a natural extension of him gaining sentience, especially if the video game NPC he was before didn't have the capability. Now, as for his 10 levels in Vermin Lord, well, that name fits right at home with the samurai theme. Lords in Japanese fantasy and fiction are often depicted possessing great skill and ability in battle. After all, as we mentioned in the last video, in the Sengoku period of Japanese history, Lord might as well have been synonymous with Warlord and thus it was practically a requirement to be a master of warfare. So it could be that a vermin lord is a powerful warrior class available to those of insectoid races that would provide even more powerful abilities than a typical insect fighter. 
However, it has been briefly alluded to multiple times that Cocytus also has a number of insectoid minions under his command, some of which are actually quite high level. For instance, many of the creatures who were with him alongside Entoma while he was leading the expedition against the Lizardmen were his minions, and they are in fact supposed to be a higher level than Entoma. It's possible that much like Aura, Kyohuko, Entoma, Demiurge, and so on, that some of his classes would allow him to summon or control creatures. I mean, given the commanding nature of its name, Vermin Lord would be a perfect title for such a class. However, we can't rule out the possibility that these minions are more akin to Shalter's Vampire Brides or Demiurge's Seven Evil Lords, aka mercenary monsters, beings acquired through magic contracts that would expend gold in exchange for their indefinite services. These creatures would then be assigned as Cocutus's minions through some kind of footnote in his biography page. Then, when Nazrik was transported out of the video game Yggdrasil and into the New World, they became his actual minions. Ultimately, his title as given by warrior Takuma Kazuchi is the Ruler of the Frozen Glacier, which is the name for the fifth floor of Nazrik. So perhaps Takuma Kazuchi meant to allude to the idea that he leads an army of insect creatures who live on his floor. In any case, as you would expect from the warrior Cocutus, he is fairly chummy with most of his insect minions. It is well known that Cocutus is good friends with most of the insectoids of Nazarick, including Kyohuko and Gosho Kokochuo of the Five Worst. Although there is one notable exception, and that is for Entoma, who is infamously known amongst the insect denizens of Nazarick as the Familiar Eater, stemming from her habit of snacking on other insects. But more on her when we start the video series on the Pleiades. Anyway, that's everything related to his racial classes. Next would be his 70 levels and job classes, which we're actually going to take a look at right now. Cocutus is designed to deal both high burst damage and high sustained damage. Not only does he have powerful skills like the Wisdom King Strikes, but he also has four limbs that can each be equipped with one of the 20 weapons in his arsenal. Not to mention that he can also cast a number of frost-based attacks and disabling abilities that further strengthen his close quarter combat capabilities, these all stemming from his job class levels. But despite the fact that he has over 70 of them, we really only know 20. There's 10 in Kensei, 5 in Asuda, and 5 more in Knight of Niflheim, each providing a unique aspect that makes Cocutis more powerful. So let's take a look at exactly what those are and finish off this character profile by examining the rest of his build, abilities, and equipment. Then, by the end, hopefully you'll finally have an answer to the title question of how strong is Cocutis. Starting with the first job class of Kensei, translating directly to Sword Saint. It is an ancient Japanese honorary title bestowed upon Japanese swordmasters who possess truly legendary and incomparable skill. So legendary, in fact, that it implied that only one person could have the title at any one time. The word saint is used in the translation to imply that the skill of the swordsman transcends that of the material world. One of the most famous kensei in Japanese history you may recognize from Fate Grand Order as Miyamoto Musashi, a well-known warrior from the Sengoku period who wielded a sword in each hand and had an undefeated dueling record of 61 straight victories. Drawing from this, a sword saint in the context of Overlord is likely an uncommon job class, as in one that maxes out at 10 levels and is only available to those with specific kinds of classes, which at this point seems to be fighter type classes. As for the abilities a sword saint may have, well, it's probably the source of many, if not all, his Buddhist themed sword abilities, especially since the bulk of them have religious connotations and seem quite magical in the sense that they make his swordsmanship seem so powerful that it borders on the divine. So what exactly are these Buddhism-related sword skills? Well, first is Akalanata, or in Japanese, Fudo Myogeki, meaning a movable Wisdom King Strike, a move created through a combination of two skills called Fudo's Binding and Kurikata Ken, the Divine Dragon Sword. Fudo's Binding would first summon a ghostly apparition of the immovable Wisdom King, which would work to debuff the target's evasion. This was followed up by Kurikata Ken, which was an attack that required the user to stand still and to power up before they would soon unleash a devastating blow. Now, using the two sequentially was the combination technique known as the Immovable Wisdom King Strike. There were actually five of these, one for each of the Wisdom Kings, though the Immovable Strike did the most damage. And given that it is a Buddhist-themed attack, it makes sense that the strength of the evasion debuff and the damage dealt scaled proportionally with the lower the opponent's karma rating meaning beings like Eins or Demiurge would be affected the most. Anyway, each of the three names all reference the same being. In Japanese Buddhism, Fudo Myo is one of the Wisdom Kings, often depicted wielding a sword to slice through ignorance and a lasso to bind demons. 
Akalanata refers to the ancient Mahayana deity known as the Immovable Protector, one that was adopted into Indian Buddhism as the Wisdom King Akala. Finally, the Kudikata Sword references the Dragon King Kudikata Fudo, which is just another personification of the Wisdom King Fudo. In this form, he is depicted as a dragon wrapped around a large divine sword. According to legend, Fudo had to fight the representative of a different religion, and so changed himself into a giant flaming sword in order to swing himself at his opponent. When the opponent did the same, the two became locked in a stalemate. So Fudo transformed into the Dragon King, then wound himself around the sword and slowly devoured it, granting him what we now know as the Sword of Wisdom. And it's with this sword that Fudo cuts away the three poisons, greed, hatred, and delusion. That's why when Kakutis uses this skill, his battle cry is, destroy the three poisons, could he cut a sword? However, that single immovable Wisdom King strike isn't the end-all be-all for his attacks. It's actually the first hit in a multi-part combo called the Bright King Combo. This entails performing each of the Wisdom King strikes in quick succession, and it's a move where the five Wisdom Kings would be summoned and each would strike the opponent with a special attack. When all five are summoned, they will then form a circle around the opponent and stretch their hands forward, restraining any opponent whose karma value is negative, opening up a window for the user to freely perform another attack of their choice. So this combination technique was naturally quite powerful, as it could potentially penetrate the immunities that one would typically expect raid bosses to have. As such, it could only be performed once a day. This was the favorite combo of warrior Takemakazuchi. He would regularly use it in raids in conjunction with other techniques from other party members. For one, he would have them use their ability to set their opponent's karma rating far past the normal lowest values of negative 500 and change it all the way to negative 1000. This in turn would maximize the damage and debuffs received by the combo. Because it was such a strong attack that fit his build so well, Takemakazuchi made sure his creation could perform at least the first part of it. But it's also implied that Kakutis can perform more than one Wisdom King strike, so it's not unreasonable to assume that Kakutis can perform the entire Bright King combo himself. Moving on, Kakutis has five levels in Asuda. Asuda are a class of divine beings in Hinduism. In the earliest writings, it was a general term for spiritual entities that could have good or bad qualities. But later on, the Asura became known as evil, malevolent, or power-seeking deities, which was in contrast to the Sura who were considered the noble or good deities. A notable relatable aspect of both types of deities is that many of them are depicted as possessing multiple arms. In light of this, Japan and Japanese video games sometimes use the term Asura to refer to beings with more than one pair of arms. So naturally, the Asura class would be for those who want to create a character who can fight with just that, many arms. Kakutis in particular has 21 weapons at his disposal, and his build allows him to wield one weapon in each hand, making for a total of four at once, or up to five if you also assume that he uses his tail in battle. Now, given that Asuda is one of the more rare job classes, it likely had a large selection of hidden requirements in order to be unlocked. It's also pretty safe to assume that it's not what grants Kakutis his multiple arms, since appearance changing classes are mostly attributed to the racial tree, not the job tree. Taking that into account, my guess would be that Asuda is a class only available to heteromorphic races that possessed multiple sets of arms. So once a character had this attribute, and other requirements like dual wielding combat skills were met, the Asuda class would then be unlocked and give the user the ability to fight with more than two weapons at a time. I mean, quad wielding is certainly an extremely powerful ability that would massively increase your DPS, so it makes sense for it to be locked behind numerous obscure requirements. Aside from this though, there is one other ability possessed by Kakutis that could have been provided by the Asura class, and that's Razor Edge Rasetsu. Rasetsu refers to the Rakshasa, a race of ferocious man-eating demons in Hindu mythology. Rakshasa, like much of Hinduism, would end up incorporated into Indian Buddhist mythology, which would then later be adopted into Japanese Buddhism. The Japanese pronounced Rakshasa as Rasetsu, leading to the name Razor Edge Rasetsu. In Japanese fantasy and shonen fiction, the word Rasetsu is often used as a cool sounding name to imply something dark, sinister, mysterious, or dangerous, and has since lost much of its connection to Buddhism. Now, as an ability, its function is unknown, but it appears to be a self-buff skill. The Razor Edge portion of the name hints at some kind of power-up, and it's known to be used while Kakutis is casting cold and wind spells, presumably in order to improve them some way. Speaking of cold magic, let's now move on to Knight of Niflheim. Niflheim or World of Fog is one of the nine worlds of Norse mythology, and it's the homeland of primordial darkness, cold, mist, or ice. While initially uninhabited, Odin would end up appointing Loki's daughter Hel as the ruler of the region of Niflheim called, well, Hel. 
It's from this that the word hell became associated with the underworld, the place for the souls of those who did not die glorious deaths in battle and therefore couldn't enter Valhalla. There's very clearly some interesting parallels between Cocytus's namesake and this Niflheim class, especially since both words relate to an icy cold underworld. However, Norse mythology doesn't have any mention of a group of knights in service to hell in Niflheim, at least from what we could find anyway, unless the name itself is more of a reference to the warriors who didn't die a hero's death. If so, that would be a rather ironic title for Cocytus, especially given his overall design theme. So this leads me to believe that the primary connection here is just the cold environment of Niflheim itself. As implemented in the game of Yggdrasil, a knight of Niflheim would probably be quite proficient both in the cold and with the cold. They could potentially fight or buff themselves with ice spells, have protection from ice damage, survive icy weather, use the temperature to afflict their enemies with debuffs, block attacks with barriers of ice, and I'm sure more of that sort of thing. The name itself also implies it would generally entail close range abilities, as the class was most likely intended for warriors who wanted to supplement their close range fighting abilities with ice magic. We do in fact know of one such ability possessed by Cocytus that is directly granted by Knight of Niflheim. It's the passive ability called Frost Aura. This makes his surroundings extremely cold, dealing continuous ice damage and slowing nearby creatures. At full power, it could reach a distance of well beyond 30 meters. Naturally, for a close combat warrior, an area of effect slow aura is a pretty useful ability. Of course, in the new world, extreme cold damage wouldn't just subtract a number off the opponent's HP bar. It could go so far as to outright freeze nearby creatures or at least give them severe frostbite as demonstrated against lizardmen. As we saw, only the tribal chiefs who were a relatively high level survived the attack. Cocytus himself is actually immune to the cold. As we mentioned before, whether this was a special ability that warrior Takuma Kazuchi added to his exoskeleton, or just a special passive from a class like Knight of Niflheim is unknown. But this would no doubt ensure that Cocytus himself would not be affected by the aura, assuming that it didn't already avoid friendly fire. I mean, this is a genuine concern in the new world. Unlike Yggdrasil, friendly fire was enabled. So it's fully possible that your own abilities could damage yourself, and even your own allies. Fortunately, most of the servants of Nazarick, including all of the undead, were immune. But even if they weren't, Cocytus does have limited control over the effects and range of the aura. He normally has it virtually shut off, having it only affect a small area around him with a cold chill. Anyway, Frost Aura is the only confirmed ability associated with Knight of Niflheim, but he does have a number of other powerful cold spells that could come from it as well. Piercing Icicle launches a shotgun blast of icicles the size of one's arm to rain down on the opponent. This offensive spell would be effective against groups at close range, or it could be used to deal a powerful blow to a single target. The name itself also implies some kind of armor penetrating quality. Second is Ice Pillars. This was also used against the Lizardmen to produce these giant ice pillars that would act as a goal line. Cocytus basically told the Lizardmen that if they crossed the threshold that these pillars marked, then they would die. Its actual purpose though is unknown but I'm sure it could be used to entomb enemies in ice or even block weak ranged attacks. Another ability that Cocytus is mentioned to have is Cold Breath. Though in name only, perhaps it entails Cocytus firing a blast of cold air in a cone-shaped area of effect from his mouth. Then finally the last known spell and one of his most powerful is Frostburn Smite. This projects a blast of icy cold wind over a short distance to freeze opponents in place and deal considerable damage. If it succeeds, the frozen enemies can be easily shattered into pieces with a follow-up blow. In this respect, the ability may function similarly to an instant kill spell like Ainz's Grasp Heart. Enemies not outright immune to the effect who also fail to resist the spell would effectively be killed instantly or at least removed from battle. Which brings us to the end of everything about his job classes and abilities. But what about his weapons and armaments now? Well, Cocytus's usual weapon is the Decapitation Fang a large silvery blue halberd that he is normally seen holding in the anime, as well as his favorite weapon to use in regular combat. Little is known about this weapon, though the name Decapitation Fang may be a reference to the special weapon property in Dungeons and Dragons called Vorpal, which has a 5% chance of instantly killing your opponent via decapitation on a successful hit. But then again, it could just be a cool sounding name. Halberds were typically used as a combination of a poleaxe and a spear. The leverage provided by wielding it in two hands to make a large chopping motion would cleave through shields and armor, while the spear tip could keep opponents at bay from a distance. It gave the user the ability to engage from beyond the reach of a regular one-handed weapon. 
but since it required two hands, the wielder couldn't use a shield. That said, Cocutus as a level 100 NPC undoubtedly has the strength to effortlessly cleave through any creature in the New World even while wielding Decapitation Fang with only one hand. If he were, for instance, in a sparring match with a level 100 NPC, especially a close combat specialist with high defenses like Albedo or Sibas, he would most likely have to use it two-handed in order to penetrate their defenses with overwhelming force. Then, with his two other arms, he could wield two other blades or one other two-handed weapon at the same time. It really all came down to the type of situation that he was in. And some of his repertoire were no doubt large weapons like the Decapitation Fang, ones that were intended for use against durable melee frontliners and tanks while others were known to be thin, fast katana-like weapons that could be swung more rapidly and quickly decimate more lightly armored opponents. We got to see one of these katana-like weapons in action while fighting the Lizardmen. Kakutis had pulled out what's called the Royal God Slayer Blade, a tachi, which is the Japanese equivalent of a longsword, measuring over 180 centimeters in length. Naturally, a sword that's 1.8 meters long would be far too massive for a typical human. But given that we're talking about Cocutus, who's 2.5 meters tall, it's actually the perfect size. Of all the weapons that Cocutus owned, this one was the sharpest, and it was the one that Cocutus revered the most. You see, Takemakazuchi had left it to him, presumably after acquiring better gear. So because it was a valued possession from his creator, Cocutus would only draw it for an opponent whose warrior spirit he respected. Now, aside from these, we don't know too much else about his other equipment. We do, however, know that after the Shaltier incident, he was given one of two world items, either Hygieia's Chalice or Billion Blades, both of which have unknown abilities. Though, if I had to guess, I'd say Billion Blades was the one given to Cocutus since it sounds like something straight out of Fate's Day Night. You know, something similar to the Gate of Babylon or Unlimited Blade Works. So, perhaps it gives the user the ability to create large quantities of weapons or maybe even switch them out instantly on the fly. That could have been how he was able to draw the Royal Godslayer Blade out of what seemed to be thin air. If that was the case, then it would definitely be a useful tool for Cocutus and his collection of over 20 weapons. So, now that we know everything there is to know about Cocutus' abilities and gear, let's quickly recap everything that I've mentioned over the past four videos and finally start to answer the question of how strong he is. As I said in the beginning, ultimately, Cocutus' build is designed to have both high burst damage and high sustained damage. Not only does he have powerful warrior skills that can push out a very high amount of damage in a short period of time, he also has four limbs that can each be equipped with powerful legendary class gear that can attack simultaneously. It's this balanced damage mix that makes him fairly effective against many different builds. When against a tank, his high sustained damage can rapidly wear them down, and when against glass cannons, his burst damage can quickly kill them with a few powerful skills before they can deal any significant damage. He also has a number of cold-themed attacks and disabling abilities that can be used against opponents at close range. So, knowing all of this, his two main weaknesses then would be ranged opponents and burst damage. I mean, his defensive capabilities are just not that high, and he doesn't seem to have any powerful defensive skills. So, if he does take a big hit, then he'll end up losing a lot of HP. Yeah, sure, he has his natural armor exoskeleton, which is designed to give him a decent amount of survivability, but that's just not powerful enough to really protect him for a long time from opponents with high damage. On top of that, due to the limited range of most of his offensive skills, he has to get within about 30 meters of an opponent to really do anything to them. A build like Shalter's could easily kite Cocutus with a combination of her ranged spells and flight ability. However, the upside to his build is that if he can make it close enough to an opponent, then he will almost always destroy anything that isn't a close combat specialist like him. Pretty much, he is, to put it as simply as possible, a regular old melee DPS build that you can find in almost any MMO. So then, how powerful is he? Well, compared to the other Guardians, we already have a pretty good idea. As we've discussed before, there exists a rock-paper-scissors relationship between Albedo, Sebas, and Cocutis. Now, that's not to say that there's a particularly massive difference between the three of them. It's just that each of them have a slight edge over the other. As you might expect, Cocutis' physical attack is the highest of the three, while his physical and magical defenses are at the lowest. However, he has just as much HP and better resistances than Sebas, meaning he's less likely to be affected by debuffs and disables. Then he also has more agility than Albedo, meaning he's more likely to dodge attacks. On top of that, he has the second highest magical attack which reflects his investment in magic caster classes. All things considered though, these are all just minor differences in their base stats. The more drastic difference stems from the nature of their active skills and abilities. 
While all three have a mix of offensive and defensive skills, Kakutis' samurai-style classes have lots more damage and attack spells, while Albedo's Dark Knight-style classes focuses more on defensive skills and even healing or debuff spells. Then, Sibas' monk-style classes offer a balanced mix of offense, defense, and utility. And of course we can't forget about his dragon transformation. Using this knowledge, we can tell that Kakutis has the best offense and can beat Albedo. Albedo is the most durable and can beat Sebas, while Sebas is the most well-balanced and can beat Kakutis. Reason being that Kakutis has more sustained high-powered offensive skills that can overpower Albedo's defenses, whereas Albedo herself doesn't have any particularly powerful attacks that could kill Kakutis quickly. It would turn into this battle of attrition in which Kakutis would end up on top. Similarly, Albedo can beat Sebas because she can outlast him and his dragon transformation with her many defensive skills, abilities, and armor. Then without his transformation, he doesn't have enough attack power to threaten Albedo very much, if at all. Don't get me wrong though, Sibas' dragon transformation can push out a lot of damage in a very short window, which is why he can crush Kakutis' low defense before Kakutis would really have time to do anything. Now, what about the other floor guardians? Well, Shalter should be able to beat Kakutis thanks to her specialized 1v1 build. And Mare is the king of wide area offensive magic and could easily nuke him or any other floor guardian for that matter with his powerful AoE nature magic. Demiurge could harass Kakutis from a distance with his summons and skills, but I suspect they would lack the offensive punch to really bring Kakutis down quickly. He would be forced to extend the fight as he would have to slowly whittle Kakutis down, which honestly fits quite well with his style of fighting anyway. Finally, how powerful is he compared to the New World Denizens? Well, as with all level 100 NPCs, it isn't even a contest. He's basically outright immune to anything in the New World that isn't around the same power level as a centuries-old Dragonlord or an awakened Godkin. This mostly in part to his immunity to both attacks and spells from any creature below around level 60. But overall, that's how strong Kakutis is. The only reason the Lizardmen lasted as long as they did was because Kakutis wanted to give them a somewhat noble death. He even let the two Shasha brothers take their absolute best shots against him. Now, if this same battle was against Adventurers or the Theocracy Black Scripture, then it would have been over much, much quicker. I'm sure you can't imagine Kakutis giving those types of enemies enough respect to have the opportunity to fight back. They definitely would have just been one-shot. But yeah, that's pretty much everything about Kakutis. If you made it all the way to the end, then please do let me know in the comments. Also, don't forget that the Succubay merch is still available, and I do talk about Overlord every week on Twitch. So, if you want to check either of those out, then feel free to do so through the links in the description. But anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching, and if you enjoyed this type of anime content, then you already know what to do. So, until next time, ciao!